Hey everyone, this is an introductory lesson on ECG. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about ECG paper and how it's laid out. We're also going to talk about the PQRST wave, talk about what each of those waves actually means. And we're also going to look at a method of reading ECGs and look at how we can determine heart rate, rhythm, axis, and intervals from an ECG. So to begin, we'll first look at ECG paper and how it's laid out. If we were to take a close-up look at ECG paper, we would see that ECG paper is made up of many small boxes that are grouped within larger boxes and each of these larger boxes are a grouping of five by five of these smaller boxes. So the horizontal length of each of these large boxes is 0 0.2 seconds of time. So the horizontal axis of ECG paper denotes time. With regards to the vertical height of each of these large boxes that actually denotes five millimeters. So the vertical axis of ECG paper denotes voltage of the particular wave you're looking at. So again, very important to recognize the horizontal axis denotes time, the vertical axis denotes voltage. So if you were to take an cl even closer look at each of these small boxes, at a horizontal axis or the horizontal area, each of these small boxes denotes 0 0.04 seconds of time. So five of these would again add up to 0 0.2 seconds. And the vertical height of each of these small boxes denotes one millimeter. So that's very important. That'll help you a lot if you can recognize that each of the small boxes vertically denotes one millimeter. Because we use this number a lot to calculate if there's any left ventricular hypertrophy or left atrial enlargement, those types of things. So it's very important to know that. But it's also important to recognize that the horizontal axis denotes time and that each of these boxes represents 0.04 seconds of time because we're going to use this a lot as well to calculate and make sure that, say, the PR interval is not prolonged, those types of things. So it's important to use when we're looking at intervals. We're going to talk a bit more about that later. So we're next going to move on to the PQRS T wave. So if you haven't already commit this to memory, first, it's pretty easy because it's alphabetical, but think about it again. So we'll go through this again together. We have the P wave first. We have a downward Q wave, an upward R wave, a downward S wave, and then generally an upward T wave. So again, commit this to memory if you haven't already. The P wave denotes atrial depolarization. That's what the P wave means. That's what actually happens with regards to the P wave. The QRS complex denotes ventricular depolarization. And the T wave generally denotes ventricular repolarization. Now, in some cases, you may see a U wave, and that is thought to be due to Purkinje fiber repolarization. You're not going to always see this, but I just thought I would add this here for completion. Now, each of these waves can be categorized or organized into intervals and segments. So one of the big ones we're going to talk about is the PR interval. The PR interval starts from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS wave or the QRS complex. The QRS complex itself starts from the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the S wave. And the QT interval starts from the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the T wave. So these are the three I want you to remember. There are also PR segment from the end of the P wave to the beginning of the Q QRS complex. And there's the ST segment, which goes from the end of the S wave to the beginning of the T wave. I don't want you to think about them too much right now. We're going to get into more detail um, later in later lessons because ST segment uh, is very important when we're looking at uh, any signs of uh, possibly an ST uh, elevation, MI, those types of conditions. So they're very important, but we're not going to talk about them right now. So we're first going to talk about heart rate. So how can we determine heart rate from an ECG? So we're going to first just talk about the basics of heart rate. A normal heart rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Bradycardia is less than 60 beats per minute. And tachycardia is greater than 100 beats per minute. So how do we actually calculate a heart rate from an ECG reading? There are actually a few different methods. And method number one, which is looking at QRS complexes times six, is probably the easiest method. And that gives us a rough estimate of beats per minute. 
The second method is taking 60, the number 60, and dividing it by the RR interval time. And then the third method is taking the number 300 and dividing it by how many number of large boxes there are between RR intervals. So 300 times the number of large boxes between each uh, R wave will give us a estimate of heart rate as well. So here are a couple of examples. The first one is sinus bradycardia and the second one is sinus tachycardia. So if we were to apply the first method to this ECG strip, we would see there's one, two, three, four, five, six QRS complexes times six is 36 beats per minute. So that is sinus bradycardia. We can also do it on the sinus tachycardia. How many complexes do we see here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 20 times six is 120 beats per minute. So that is tachycardia. So you can see that's very simple, right? Now, if we try to use some of these other methods, we'll just attempt, um, we can try method three here, 300 divided by number of large boxes between each RR interval. So if we were to take a look at the sinus bradycardia example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So approximately eight large boxes. So if we were to take 300, 300 divided by eight, is about 37.5. Well, we said we had 36 from our first method, so it's pretty close. And with regards to method two, we can quickly do that as well. So we can go, uh, this is just an approximation, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, approximately eight large boxes. Each large box is approximately 0.2 seconds. So that's 1.6 seconds, so 60 divided by 1.6 comes to, again, 37.5 beats per minute. So they're all very similar. The first one we had was 36 beats per minute on this ECG strip, and the other two were 37.5, so very similar. Those are the three methods we can use to actually calculate a heart rate from an ECG strip. So now that we know how to calculate heart rate, how do we determine the rhythm? And I'm going to just talk about the basics with regards to rhythm, and we're going to talk about very complex rhythms in future lessons. But the first one that I want you to just think about, the first question when you're trying to determine rhythm is, does each QRS complex have a preceding P wave? That's a key question. If it's yes, it's a sinus rhythm. And then you can kind of distinguish it even more. If it's a heart rate greater than 100, it's sinus tachycardia. If it's a heart rate less than 60, it's sinus bradycardia. Any irregular rate um, with each QRS complex having a preceding P wave is a sinus arrhythmia. Other arrhythmias that we'll talk about in future lessons. So this is basically what I, all I want you to just get from this lesson is just, is it a sinus rhythm or is it not? The other rhythms we'll talk about in other lessons will include atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, premature atrial contraction, premature ventric ventricular contraction, and some others as well. The method for finding the axis or the mean vector of depolarization within the heart is the following. If we were to look at all the leads on an ECG, we'll see lead one, two, three, AVL, AVR, AVF, we'll see precordial leads. What we want to do is we want to look at find the most positive QRS complex. So when you look at all of those leads on an ECG um, reading or ECG output, find the lead with the most positive QRS complex. Then find the second most positive QRS complex. So look for a lead that has a um, second most positive QRS complex. And then you want to look for a lead that has the most equal phasic QRS complex, which means that you see an R wave that's equally as positive as an S wave that's negative. So that may all sound very confusing to you, but we can use an even quicker way of determining is the axis normal. If we look at lead one and two and they're both upright, they both have R waves that are both pointing upwards, that is a normal axis. And why is that? Well, because if the mean vector of depolarization of the heart is pointing in the direction it should be from right upper to left lower, it should be pointing in this direction. And the two 
most positive leads with regards to this are lead one and lead two. So they're going in the same direction as lead one and lead two. They're both going to be upright. Now, if it's a leftward deviated axis, which means it's going counterclockwise, it's being pulled toward the left, we're going to see an upward lead one, but a possibly downward lead two. And why is that? Well, if the axis has been shifted upward, so if it, instead of it's going instead of it going down toward the uh, lower left, it may be going to the side or maybe going even higher up. What that means is it's still going in the direction of lead one, but now it's almost going in the opposite direction of lead two. So when it goes in the opposite direction of lead two, it's going to be negative. And if it's right axis deviation, it means that it's going to be pulled toward this area of the chart over here. And what that means is that it's going to actually, that mean vector of depolarization is going to be in this direction over here. So if we look at lead one here, it's going to be negative because it's almost going in the opposite direction of lead one. Lead two now, it's, it's still kind of almost in the same direction of lead two. So if it's a right axis deviation, say it's pointing down toward ABF, for instance, that's a right axis deviation. It's still going generally in the same direction of lead two, but it's almost going at a right angle or even almost in the opposite direction of lead one. So that's why it's negative in lead one. So that's a quick way of determining is the axis normal or is it left axis deviation or right axis deviation. We're going to talk about more about this later uh, in future lessons. And now we're going to talk about intervals. So we went through rate, rhythm, axis, and intervals, the last step here. The two big ones that I want you to take away are the PR interval that starts from the beginning of the P wave and ends at the beginning of the QRS complex. This, this should be and is normally 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds in duration. This you should commit to memory, 0 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. If it's longer than this, we're going to talk about AV blocks, and we'll get into later lessons about this, but just try to remember this amount of time. And remember, each of those large boxes on an ECG paper is 0 0.20 seconds. So if it's larger than one of those large boxes, if it's, the duration is larger than the horizontal length of one of those large boxes, then you know it's a prolonged PR interval. The next interval we're going to talk about is a QRS duration, and it generally should be some say less than 0.12 seconds, and others say anywhere from 0.07 to 0.10 seconds. So, but generally less than, think about less than 0.12 seconds. That should be a normal QRS duration. And we talk about QT interval, and it's a bit complex for beginner lesson on ECGs, but the QT interval we've talked about before, it is formally calculated by what we call the Bazet's formula. So QT calculated equals QT divided by the square root of an RR interval. So you really don't need to know that, but just remember that in males, in females, the QT intervals are generally different. And in males, the normal is, the normal QTC is less than or equal to 0 0.44 seconds. And in females, the normal QTC is less than or equal to 0 0.45 to 0 0.46 seconds. So these are again important with regards to certain medications. They can prolong the QT and other instances where we want to keep an eye on that as well. So now that we know the basic approach to reading ECG, rate, rhythm, axis, and intervals, we're going to take this information, we're going to use it to assess different disease conditions like left ventricular hypertrophy and right and left atrial enlargement and see how all of these things can be affected in those conditions. So please check out my next lesson on those conditions. If you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, clicking the notification bell to keep up to date on this channel. And thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.